Well, blessings, everybody. I'm Dale, and welcome to Answers. Thank you so much for joining with me today, checking some late-breaking news right at the very moment as we're going on the air right now. Uh, let me check. I think this is right. Uh, well, they hadn't even pulled it up. It's so late-breaking, we don't even know yet. Uh, looks like they've named the new king. You know, all the hubbub in recent days has been about the baby that was born over in Great Britain. Uh, the next heir to the throne of Great Britain, uh, which is some curious things because as all that was developing and all that was going along, you saw all the media hubbub that happened with it. You saw all the things that occurred with it. And have you ever wondered just what is that all about? How does that come about? It's actually a very interesting study, which we will not get into right now, okay? But it boils down to this, okay? It boils down to this that this is who man exalts, and this is who man honors, and this is who's going to be uh, the next king of Great Britain. It's an amazing thing when you go back through the hundreds of years and see how things have uh, transpired and how people became kings and the intrigue and the murders and the deaths that have taken place and stuff like that. Uh, but this little bitty baby that was born, who I think is going to be called George, and you know they have three or four different names with them, uh, I think it was George um, Alexander Spencer is what I want to say. <clears throat> and if you notice, they don't have a last name. Okay, they don't have a last name. But the names are very, very important because they carry along certain lineages and things like that. But now we've got another King George, which ought to ring the bell in your historical ears related to some things. But it was ringing the bell in my ear <clears throat> when all this was going on here just a couple of days ago uh, of just the wonder of new life. Did you see the little baby pictures that were made right there? Did you see what occurred and how it happened? And really how the media in the world was just sort of enamored and focused in on this one baby. And just a precious time, you know, when the mom and dad come out on the street right there and show everybody the baby. They were doing the whole thing because the baby raises his hand and gives that little king wave, they said. <laughs> you know, it's just a cute thing. But it got me thinking about some things. Can you imagine? You know, we do sit there and look at one person and say, here's somebody who is born <clears throat> into <clears throat> royalty. Someone that the world describes as being royal. Someone whose life has, ar his life has already been determined for him. Okay? You know, the, the queen right now is the, lo the longest serving monarch, I, I think ever. I'm not sure forever and ever. I mean, it's just wild how long she has served there in, in, in Great Britain. And uh, Prince Charles, her son, is sitting there waiting to become king. He's going to wind up being one of the shortest monarchies ever, just a factor of the, the years of life and things like that. But um, it's interesting when you look at these things that this is someone that because of being born into this situation will live a certain kind of life to hold that, that the balance of their life. And the kings, the queens actually said that it's the, uh, it is blessed misery is in one way she sort of described what it was, that type of life. But still it boils down to this. This is because of the decisions that man has made. And when I'm looking at that little baby, I'm thinking about this. Every child that is born, every child that is born has the potential to be a prince, to be the king. And you say, well, not over a whole nation and things like that. Sometimes it's because of a nation like that, it's by birth. Sometimes in a nation like ours, the king we have is a, a, a publicly elected type of situation. You say, well, we don't have kings. Yeah, they act like kings, okay? But, you know, the leadership that we have, I'm not really talking about that. I'm talking about how the Most High God views and looks at uh, we as human beings. So I thought we'd spend a little bit of time on this and just sort of remind ourselves about some things because sometimes we forget this. Sometimes we look at situations like that and go, well, this is somebody that has things that I'll never be able to have or uh, I'm in a different place in life and I'll never be able to do anything like that. And that's not exactly right because each and every one of us came about in the same way and are described in the same way. And each and every one of us can be something else. Okay, let me show what I mean. Uh, just thought I'd go to the 139th Psalm. Okay, it's a psalm that's very, very familiar with, with, to many of us. And, uh, and it's just the psalmist is just speaking of the Most High God and how powerful God is. And, uh, you know, usually I would just sort of jump in the middle of it to pick up the verse where I'm going at. It's down in the 13th and 14th verse. But let me start at the beginning. 
just to sort of set the context of where you can see, to where each one of us will know something beyond any shadow of a doubt, okay? Because I really want you to know this. Here's the 139th Psalm, verse 1. O Lord, Thou hast searched me and known me. Thou knowest my down-sitting and my uprising. Thou understandest my thought afar off. In other words, God knows everything there is to know about us. He knows our thoughts. He knows our desires. He knows everything. It's a useful thought to keep in mind. Thou compassest my path and my lying down, and art acquainted with all my ways. For there is not a word in my tongue, but lo, O Lord, thou knowest it altogether. Thou hast beset me behind and before, and had laid thine hand upon me. It's literally saying that God has encompassed all about us, before us, behind us, and his hand is upon us. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain unto it. And you see this, that, that phrase right there used quite a bit in Scripture. Uh, Isaiah says it. The psalmist right here says it. And we encounter these things day in and day out. We were talking about the other night at church, talking about how the heavens declare the wonder and the glory of the Lord. And that's, uh, the knowledge that is uh, there that we can see is just far beyond anything that we can comprehend. And he's just acknowledging it. It's just too wonderful. Now watch where he's going on this. Whether shall I go from thy spirit? Or whither shall I flee from thy presence? In other words, God, can I get away from you? Where can I go that I'm not going to be in the presence of God? Where can I go that the Spirit of the Lord will not be there? If I ascend up into heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. Well, that's intriguing, isn't it? And God is everywhere. God is the creator of all. Okay? And the psalmist is saying, I can't go anywhere where you're not. And he says, what about this? If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost part of the sea, even there shall thy hand lead me, and thy right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, even the night shall be light about me. Yea, the darkness hideth not from thee, but the night shineth as the day. The darkness and the light are both alike to thee. In other words, there's nothing hidden from God. <clears throat> God is not distracted by darkness. You know, if we were to plump ourselves down in the middle of total abject darkness, you ever done that in a cave? You know, turn a light off? <coughs> if you do that, you can't see anything. There is no darkness in God. He sees everything that's there. There's no darkness, there's no light. God sees everything. He knows everything. Now watch what the psalmist says here. The darkness and the light are both alike to thee. For thou hast possessed my reins, like the reins of a horse. It says, Lord, you've possessed my reins. Thou hast covered me in my mother's womb. Thou hast covered me in my mother's womb. The psalmist has some serious insight to the process of, of, of the human body and how we were born. And when I saw that little baby I was thinking about, I reflected upon that also because I've got another grandbaby about to be born here in the next week or two. And we've got several children and a bunch of grandkids. And you look at these children, and uh, they're, some of them are older now, we've got, uh, very much adult children, have grandchildren that are young uh, women about to be what the world would call adults. And you look at them and you realize each one of them were covered in the womb by the Most High God. That awareness really guides us in the way that we raise our children. That awareness guides us in the way that we should uh, treat them, particularly when they're still in the womb, especially when they're still in the womb. Because of what he's about to say right here, watch this. Again, thou hast possessed my reins, thou hast covered me in my mother's womb. In other words, the controlling nature, God is the one that's in control even from the time of birth. You see this in other portions of the scripture that he's actually given those who are believers especially. But he's given us the very works that we are to be doing for the kingdom. Those were determined before the foundations of the earth. Before anything was spoken into existence, the Lord knew what he wanted you to be doing this very moment. You have to go back up what he says. That kind of knowledge is way beyond things that I can understand. The next verse says, I will praise thee. I will praise thee, Lord. For I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Ah, oh, you've heard that before, haven't you? 
we are fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. Marvelous are the words. There's not one human that's ever been born that was a surprise of God. There's not one human that was not covered and that God did not fearfully and wonderfully make them. Now, there's some intriguing corollaries that come out of that. Just think of the most evil person that pops into your mind right now, whether it be historical or current. Okay, you got it? They were fearfully and wonderfully made. Fearfully and wonderfully made. And it's God's desire for them to be in right relationship with Him. Does God know everything that's going to happen with Him? Did He know it before He fearfully and wonderfully made Him? Yeah. Well, we as humans want to come back <clears throat> and ask those linear questions. Well, then why did God create them? Ah, such knowledge is too high, too far beyond my understanding. Because God's got a purpose to His praise and His honor and His glory. Did he know that evil would come about? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Then why did he create? Did he know that Adam and Eve were going to rebel against him? Yes. Yes, he knew. But God did not create a, a, a creation whereby everything is just being run like little marionettes on strings. He gave man the ability to choose. Adam and Eve, one rule. Don't eat of the fruit of that one tree. Knowledge and good and evil. Everything else is open. Don't do that. One rule. You would think you could follow one rule, right? Because of that, rebellion, death, and sin came into the world. Because of that, God's plan of salvation, which he knew and which he planned before creation, before he spoke anything in existence, has been coming about. And you say, well, I don't understand all that. I know. Isn't it wonderful? Isn't it just amazing? Let me read a couple of verses right here, and we'll take a break. I am fearfully and wonderfully made. The psalmist was, I am, you are. Marvelous are thy works. And that my soul knows well. He says, it's really marvelous what you've done, Lord. My substance was not hid from thee when I was made in secret and curiously wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. It's interesting to read different translations when it talks about this, but it's basically talking about of just how we as human beings come about the act of procreation. And he says, this wasn't hidden from you. My very substance you knew about when I was made in secret in that most intimate of time, in the most intimate of ways, and that how this came about. And the next verse says, thine eyes, Lord, saw my substance, yet being unperfect. And in thy book all my members were written, which in continuance were fashioned, when as yet there was none of them. There is such a theological depth right here in these psalms that quite often we read about and get a, a little ooey-gooey feeling over, then blow over. Right here, he says that, my very substance, what I was made of, even though at the moment it was unperfect, in other words, incomplete, that my members were written in the book, in thy book. God has several books. You see them in Scripture. You see uh, the book of life. You see the Lamb's book of life. You'll see something mentioned right here, books. You see in Revelation that the Lord opened the books with the books, the book with the books. In other words, there's at least three of them. And what's being recounted right here is that the Lord knew exactly when there was none of them what he was going to do. Think about that. Before he, I mean, before he even spoke any of it in creation, he knew what he's going to do. One more verse. How precious also are thy thoughts unto me, O God. How great is the sum of them. If I should count them, there are more in numbers than the sin. When I awake... I am still with thee. Here's the thought that I want you to come away with in this 139th Psalm. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. That little king, king to be, George, precious baby. A precious baby. Has a life that's defined for him. Many, many things he will not be able to choose. You think, oh, I would love to have that kind of life. I'd love to have kind of that, that kind of life. I'm thinking, I don't think so. Okay? But he's made in the same way that each one of us is made. All mankind is fearfully and wonderfully made. Now, when we come back from the break right here, I'm going to take us somewhere else. And I'm going to show you what you can become if you choose to do that, okay? So stay with me. I'll be right back.
delicious stud, hon. Eat up. There's plenty more. Billy, eat your stud. Think of the termites whose homes were protected with Termidor. Aw, oh, Dad. The brands will never get Termidor. They're clueless. Yeah, they even think homeowners insurance covers our damage. <laughs> Do you hear laughing? It's probably just the pipes. Target pest control. We aim to please. You have always wanted to play the piano, but thought it was too late. Or, in the past, you played the piano, but you do not play anymore. Or, you've always considered yourself to be unmusical, yet there is something driving you to express yourself through music. It is not too late. Now is the time. Simply Music has come to Alabama. Cullman is the only Alabama location of this revolutionary method. Come, join us, make music. Back to answers. I'm sitting here looking at something. This popped up while I was talking a while ago, and I thought, what in the world is this? And uh, my daughter that's expecting the baby has sent me, she's keeping time. She's had contractions at 11.14 today, 12.46, 1.15, 1.29, 1.42, 1.52, 2 o'clock, and 2.07. What does that sound like, Danny? Sounds like a baby's on the way, doesn't it? Wow, and we're sitting here talking about babies today. So, Lord, be with her and bless her and protect her and watch over her. Uh, I mean, it's just amazing when you see new life like that coming about. Where I want to take us now is to uh, the book of 1 Peter, chapter 2. 1 Peter, chapter 2. And we're just looking at a couple of things, just, just reflecting upon life. We see a new baby born that's destined to be king. Did you know that everybody who is born is destined that they could be a king? They could be a king? 1 Peter chapter 2 says this. Uh, Peter's in the midst of uh, writing and telling people how to act and how to behave. And these are true believers. He's telling them, this is what you should do. He says in the first verse, therefore, I'm reading out of King James today. Wherefore, I guess I'm doing that in honor of the British people today, right? The authorized version of King James. Wherefore, laying aside all malice and all guile and hypocrisies and envyings and and evil speakings, <clears throat> well, that's a, that's a wonderful list. He says, laying aside all these things, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. He's telling them, you know, y'all are really distracted in the way that you're sort of acting, the behaving, and the things that are happening right there, and what's going on. He says, you need to quit acting this way. Lay that stuff aside. And you see that command all the time in Peter and Paul's writings, just his commands to do this, which means that we have the power and the wherewithal because the Holy Spirit dwells within us to do exactly that, to lay it aside. So he said, lay it aside, and then as newborn babies, desire the sincere milk of the Word, the Word of God. Now watch this, that you may grow thereby, that you can grow by the Word of God. If so be ye have tasted that the Lord is gracious. In other words, if you have tasted, if you have experienced the fact that the Lord is gracious and you're saved, and this is how you need to be growing. To whom, speaking of the Lord, coming as a living stone, disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God and precious. So what he's saying right here is that we should come to the living stone. We see that Jesus is described as a living stone, as the cornerstone. You see Jesus being foreshadowed in, in a type of, in a Nebuchadnezzar's dream in Daniel chapter 2. There's a stone that comes and crushes all of Nebuchadnezzar's statue that he dreams of. And so he says <clears throat> that we're coming to this living stone, disallowed, rejected by men, but chosen of God and precious. Ye also, as living stones, are built up as a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up a spiritual sacrifices 
acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. <clears throat> You're about to see something really, really interesting right here. In the Old Testament, you see a, a couple of uh, lines of forms of leadership. You see the priesthood, religious leadership, and then you'll see the kings, political leadership, right? You see those two things going on. You're going to see both of these addressed right here. In this verse right here, he said, you are a living stone. And Peter's talking to the church, the true believers. He said, you are living stones because the chief living stone, the cornerstone is a living stone. You are a living stone. And he describes this right here as a holy priesthood. If you are a true believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, you are a holy priesthood. And you say, well, I thought that priesthood was just for priests or just for pastors. Uh-uh. Not at all. Not at all. If you're a true believer, you are a holy priesthood. Now watch this. Acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. In other words, we are in right relationship with God because of what Jesus Christ did. Wherefore? Also, it is contained in the scripture. Notice Peter's quote in the Old Testament here. Behold, I have laid in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be <coughs> confounded. So he says, you will not be put to shame if you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now watch where we're going here. Unto you, therefore, which believe, he is precious. So in other words, if you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, then you believe unto salvation, just not the demonic belief. You know, James tells us the demons believe and yet they tremble. In other words, they're not saved. But if you truly believe, then you will do something. Unto you therefore which believe, he is precious. But unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same made the head cornerstone. In other words, the Jewish people rejected this chief cornerstone. They didn't believe, so they're disallowed. And it became a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. To this very day, the Lord Jesus Christ is the stone of stumbling to the Jewish people and is a rock of offense to the Jewish people. Even to them which stumble at the word, being disobedient, whereunto also they were appointed. Now, here's where we're going. The last verse or two, so hang with me here in our final moments. But you, notice that word but. So he's talking about how the Jewish people had rejected the living stone, how you have received the living stone. If you're a believer, you've received the living stone and you have become a holy priesthood. But not only are you a holy priesthood, but you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people that you should show forth the praises of him which calls you out of darkness into his marvelous light, which in the time past were not uh, people, but now the people of God, which have not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. You are a chosen generation. Don't you love that? You know, the king was chosen for this particular kind of thing by his lineage. When you choose the Lord Jesus Christ, who is Prince of Peace, what does that make you? You're a holy priesthood, a royal nation, a peculiar people, literally a chosen generation. Everyone who is born, if they choose the Lord Jesus Christ, if they believe, they repent and confess and be baptized for the remission of their sins and believe unto salvation, become part of the royal priesthood of the kingdom of the Most High God become part of the chosen generation and the royalty of that chosen generation. <clears throat> Neat to sit there and see a little baby, which someday may be king, will probably become king at some point in time when most of us have already gone to glory. But there is a greater thing that the Lord has called us to, <clears throat> to be part of a greater kingdom. Remember what kingdom means, the king's domain. If you choose him, then you are a chosen generation. Let me say it again. A royal priesthood, a holy nation. I love this. A peculiar people. What is the other, uh, another translation that says a people of his own. Well, you are a people of his own, but I love that peculiar people. Because sometimes people say, well, Christians are just strange and peculiar. Well, yeah. Okay, because we're not of this world. He said, you are a peculiar people that you should show forth the praises of him that called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. We've been called out of darkness. Remember what it said a while ago? 
in the 139th Psalm that you're fearfully and wonderfully made and that with God there is no light, there is no darkness. He sees everything. He has called us out of the darkness of the world. He's called us out of the darkness of sin into his marvelous light. He says you once were not a people, but now you're God's people. You were shown no mercy, but now you have received mercy. I mean, it is a marvelous thing to see and to understand what the Most High God has done. Yeah, we sit there and we sort of get distracted, honestly, with the ways of man, the royalty of man, and all these wonderful things. But then you begin to realize, wait a minute, all of us are made that way. Wait a minute, Lord, you humble yourself to the point of death, what it says in Philippians, to where I could be in right relationship with God through you. And because of that, I'm part of what we used to call with the children's choirs, I'm a king's kid. We really are. We're really a king's kid. And so when man goes about and has their thing and says, okay, this is the, the next exalted chief executive or this is the next king of this particular thing or this is, that's all fine. But that's not what's really important. The really important thing is where do you stand in relationship to the kingdom? If you're saved, you are positionally positionally a prince within the kingdom of the Most High God. Is that not an amazing thing? Tell you what, let's pray together here, our final moments together. <coughs> hmm. Lord, I just thank you for the wonder of your word and what you have revealed to us. Lord, I thank you for the transformed life. Lord, I do speak blessings upon this little baby that was born for uh, George, who if things continue to go like they normally go, that someday will be the monarch there will be the king. Lord, I pray that at this very moment that you will continue to protect him, that you will raise him up as a mighty, mighty, mighty God-fearing man. Lord, I pray the same thing for my little granddaughter, Elise, that's about to be born here, that they will do nothing more or less than to seek after your kingdom and to pursue you in everything that they do. And that, Lord, that you would use both of them, not only them, Lord, but the ones that are being born uh, at this very day, not only them, Lord, but us also, that you would use us and that we would walk in obedience and that your kingdom would come here on earth even as it is in heaven. Lord, we're living in days that are increasing in darkness as you told us they would be. But Lord, if we will do what you desire, then you will be glorified. And that's what we desire. We thank you and bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much for being with me and I'll see you again next time on Answers. Goodbye.